men and women throughout our history and in every culture have asked questions. Sometimes these questions concern the little details of ordinary life. How does this work? What am I going to eat? Why isn't this computer working? At other times, our questions require a bit more thought. What is this? What is this made out of? Where did this come from? And so on. In this course, we will ask even more difficult questions and maybe even attempt to answer some of the most fundamental questions possible. What is the ultimate explanation for the existence of things? Why are there beings and not just nothing? Do these questions even have a meaning? Some of these questions involve God. Is there a God? If there is, can I know if he exists? How can I know if he exists? Can I know something about him? Can I even speak about him? Is my knowledge of God limited to knowledge obtained through faith in divine revelation? Can people who do not believe in the Bible know anything about God just with the light of their natural reason? These and similar questions have been asked by men and women throughout the ages and are still asked today, even by those who consider themselves to be non-believers. In this course, we will not only seek answers to these questions, but just as importantly, we will consider how to even approach asking these questions. Thus, we seek not only to know the answers to these questions, we also want to do much more. We want to learn how to think about these questions, about how to frame them. We want to be able to understand how these questions are related with other questions and how these questions are ordered among themselves. And we want to do so in conversation with some of the greatest minds and saints of history. Our hope is that through these lessons, we come to better understand the nature of these questions, how better to ask these questions, and thereby how to better help others to ask these questions. And through asking these questions, be open to discovering the truth about the world, about ourselves, and about God in all their splendor and wonder. But first, to the title of our course, Natural Theology. What is natural theology? Although we will look at this more deeply later in the lesson, we can begin by first examining the words natural theology. Even with just an elementary knowledge of Greek, we can all quickly identify the Greek words in theology. First, theo, from the Greek word theos, which means God. Next, we have lology, which comes from the Greek logia, which in turn comes from logos, which means word, speech, account of explanation. As a suffix, it has come to mean the study of a certain subject. Thus, we have the word theologia, theology, which means the study of God. To this, we add the word natural. The Oxford English Dictionary American Edition gives us a brief definition of natural as existing in or caused by nature. So when we say natural theology, we are saying that we are studying God using our own natural powers of reason. In human beings, this means knowledge that begins with the external senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, and continues into rational and intellectual knowledge. This indicates that the study of God that we are undertaking here is based on knowledge that we can obtain through the use of our natural power of reason and with the natural light of our intellect. This contrasts with 
revealed theology, which is based on truths revealed to us by God, which we come to accept as true through the supernatural light and grace of theological faith. Thus, in natural theology, we will attempt to answer questions concerning the existence of God and how he is insofar as we can attain this knowledge with our natural powers of reason and intellect. Later in this lesson, we will examine how this type of knowledge is the highest form of knowledge that we can obtain through the use of our natural powers. To better understand the flow of our course on natural theology, let us take a quick look at the course syllabus. You will notice that this course is composed of 12 lessons. Uh, these lessons can be grouped into five sections. First, in lessons one and two, we will study what natural theology is and examine what scripture and church magisterium teach about the possibility of knowing God's existence. Second, in lessons three to six, we will follow Thomas Aquinas as he seeks to demonstrate God's existence. Once we have done this, we will consider some aspects of atheism in today's world. Third, in lessons seven to nine, we will examine some of God's attributes and how we can have knowledge of God and name him. And fourth, in lessons 10 and 11, we consider God's action outside of himself, creation, and divine providence. Finally, fifth, in lesson 12, we touch upon divine revelation and how knowledge of God through faith relates with what we have learned in this course of natural theology. One final thought. In any difficult endeavor, a trustworthy and experienced guide is indispensable. For our course on natural theology, we will take as our guide the 13th century theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas lived and worked during a crucial moment of the development of theology in medieval Western Europe. Fundamental to the development of his thought was the discovery of Aristotle's more metaphysical works in the West and translations of these works in the early 13th century. The critical assimilation of Aristotle into the medieval intellectual world and the use of his philosophy and theology represented a major turning point in the development of Western thought. As we will see, Aquinas carefully thought out the relationship between the use of reason and of philosophical reasoning with knowledge and reflection based on faith in revealed truths. In this, Aquinas makes important methodological distinctions between knowledge obtained through the use of our natural powers of reason and knowledge and knowledge obtained with the help of grace. He is thus able to clearly distinguish philosophy, which relies on the natural light of the human intellect, and theology, which has as its basis truths known in the light of faith. This is important for our course, since it makes it possible to distinguish the study of God based on the use of our natural powers, which we have been calling natural theology, from the study of God based on revealed truths, which we can call revealed theology. As we shall see, it is nevertheless important to note that although Aquinas clearly distinguishes philosophical and theological knowledge of God, he did not intend to separate or isolate these two ways of knowing God. Rather, he considered the relationship to be like that between nature and grace. Grace does not destroy nature, but rather heals nature and elevates it. In this regard, we can recall some words from St. John Paul II in his encyclical Fides et Ratio from 1998. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth. In a word, 
to know himself, so that by knowing and loving God, men and women may also come to the fullness of truth about themselves.